Are you all set? Yes, yeah. I think we're all set. 11 in the morning. I have to say it's such an honor to have you here uh, uh, joining me today. I truly appreciate that you're taking your time to be here today with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I have, I have uh, drafted some answers for you because some of them are a little bit complicated, but we can no, start with it. No, with it, the, take it as a, a, tómalo como una conversación de nosotros dos, ¿sí? Sí, no hay problema. Muy relajados. Before we commence this interview, I would like to talk about uh, your childhood environment, okay? But I like to introduce you to the audience, despite you don't need an introduction, but I have to do it. So. Dr. Alberto Perez Gomez, you are such a distinguished leader in the field of theory of architecture and architecture. You are famous for your phenomenological approach to it. And throughout your very long career, you have written many books, powerful books about theory of architecture and architecture. Your latest book is Attunement, Architectural Meaning After the Crisis of Modern Science. You are currently in Canada, Quebec, uh, right. where you teach in McGill University. Well, I'm just retired from, from my full-time teaching, yes. Yeah. Congratulations. Now you are free. I'm a free agent, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I tell you, the, the main reason of these interviews is because I like to see what is, you know, in the brain of the architect and how much the childhood environment could have impacted you, you know, in the way you grasp the space now and you interconnect all these uh, ideas and all these, you take all these philosophers and you, you study them and you bring them to architecture in, in times of meaningless architecture, unfortunately. So to start, where did you grow up? Yes, in Mexico City. And I grew up there. I stayed there until I finished my uh, my architecture education. In uh, I was about 23 when I left to go to England to do a master's and a PhD. But all my early life was in Mexico and actually in Mexico City, which already when I was born was already a big city. So I'm completely urban. You know, I have uh, no experience with it, with the countryside. <laughs> you know, I'm actually completely ignorant of plants and trees. It's very sad, but my life has been really urban. Okay, okay, that, that, that happened to many of us. And despite that, we love nature, right? I feel, oh, I, yeah. you look for it. Uh, how, we, how would you describe the house you grew up in? Well, I was fortunate maybe because uh, my, my parents, my father was an aeronautical engineer and he was uh, his school friends included architects and civil engineers so we i grew up in a in a, in two different houses but they were both uh, really modern houses they you know i had no i never grew up in a typical mexican uh, environment no, like hacienda. No, no nothing like that that's my I love them. I love them. But my but my father, from since I was a kid, when I was three years old, he had his house uh, designed by a friend. It was a modernist house, you know. The the people that because uh, where he went to school and where I later went to school was uh, uh, the Politécnico, el Instituto Politécnico Nacional de México, which is a, really a, was inspired by Miss Van der Rohe and the Bauhaus. So it was very modernist, you know, I mean, I, I, that was my education, for better or for worse, it was very uh, modern. Ba Bauhaus, you cannot expect, uh, you know, from Germans, like, very squarish and away right. from, from uh, nature. That's uh, right. And from the natural forms. That's, uh, exactly. that's interesting that, you know, most of my interviews, I and all of them I ask this question and there is something in particular about all the, the people I have interviewed. They grew up in the rural areas, not you. That's very interesting. You know? uh, and I keep on... For me, I would say that, uh, that my initial uh, intuition was maybe to, to, to react a little bit against uh, what I understood as a misunderstanding of modernism. 
because modernism can be amazing. You know, I mean, you, you know, you, you could say I, I am convinced that uh, that, for example, Miss van der Rohe did some very beautiful things. The problem, the the problem, and very moving things. The problem is uh, the imitation. You know, that the the kind of trivialization of modernism that becomes uh, really very bad. Uh, like the cities we have yeah. uh, that are really boring, uh, like square, like everything is, is, is very bad. But, uh, but I think that uh, the fact that I had an engineer father um, was actually for me an incentive to think more about uh, other values, I would say. That's really what happened. And it happened to me mostly after I finished architecture school because my own education was also driven by this kind of Bauhaus uh, mentality. Yeah. Uh, but when I finished school, I, I felt that there was a real disconnect between what I was being taught and the values of the country. So when I became a little bit more mature and I started to think about these things, I, I realized how much was missing from my education precisely because, you know, I, just to give you an idea, I had a, a professor when I was in, it was a five year program in, in, in architecture because it was, you know, it was the old way you went to school five years to become an architect. In fourth year, I had a, a, a professor that uh, wanted us to make uh, high rise buildings for a very rural, in a very rural town in Mexico for people that always lived, uh, uh, you know, basically they brought their animals to their house for for heat because it's a bit like colombia you know the altitude changes the weather and there it's higher than mexico city this town and the the, the peasants usually brought their cows into the into the cows for heat right yeah. so you know i i was absolutely disturbed by this project of of, of doing uh, low-rise uh, modernist housing for for this community and i confronted the professor i had a big problem with that but but it was that moment when things started. I started to realize that 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 architecture did not respond really to the values and the ways of life of the of the of the of the people, and that led me to try to look for more education where I could you know study maybe these things, orient myself better, and that's where my academic life comes from. You know, after I left my early architectural education, so that's. You know, so my, I, I would say that, that my position is a, was kind of reactive to my early... Rebellious, my I was early, going to say. You had this rebellious uh, way of reacting to, to this. You yeah. didn't like it. So you, 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 you try to change it in your own way. Yes, you know, I, I thought that, uh, that this kind of modernism did not do, was not useful really for for how I could practice like ethically and, and do justice to the values of, of, uh, of the diversity of Mexican cultures. As you know, there are many different cultures that, that you know, uh, I mean, even when I was going, going up in Mexico City, I, I knew very little about that, you know, the, the, the incredible richness of all the Aboriginal cultures in the country. It was kind of uh, repressed, you know, when I was growing up. It, it was, uh, the, the line was that we all spoke Spanish and, it was one culture, and uh, and that's the culture of the Mexican modernity in the revolution, and, you know, and it's completely silly, you know that, that that. So I started to figure this out. The other option, by the way, which was the 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 other way that that my young colleagues could practice architecture was a was a, was the other extreme, you could say, a kind of formalism that was a kind of expressionist, like uh, you you work for a rich client. And you basically make them a, a house that doesn't look like any other house, and and you know that was the other value, and that of course also n never convinced me. I thought that was completely stupid to think that architects could reduce their lives to serving rich clients. Yeah, you know, I thought that the, you know that the agenda really is to to think about the common good, and so that's how I started thinking about these things when I. So you, when I you think you actually think that your culture your your childhood environment in a negative way maybe by pushing you by being by making you rebellious uh, helped you to and lead you to this study of the intersection of human behavior and built environment that's, that's really good so in the eyes of alberto perez gomez and the romantic word 
Stimmung, you know, uh, the German word Stimmung. What does it mean for you? Yeah, it's a, it's you're, you're right. It's it's a word invented by by romantic philosophers. Um, I think this is exactly what you were you were mentioning. This is really what I discuss in my in my last book uh, because I'm very interested in the interaction between architecture, mood, and atmosphere. And and the German word for atmosphere is Stimmung. Uh, it's a word that is used, for example, by Peter Sumter, very well known. Uh, but but which actually, if you speak German, it actually means means mood. You know, like we, when you when you say uh, mood in English is something that we usually associate with something internal. Like when you are sad, you think it is your sadness and it's only yours. Now, the interesting thing is that neuroscience, and I can talk a little bit more about that because that's what that, that is, this is all about. Neuroscience has shown that these moods are never simply internal to your or my subjectivity. They are also and always external. And it's a real paradox. It's a difficult to to understand this problem. But this is where, where neuroscience stands, that they're neither exclusively internal nor exclusively external. It, they always appear in the interaction between our subjectivity and the environment. This is what so, we so call that, active cognition. That's right, exactly, exactly. So it's like an activity. That's right. So, so, so what I, what one has to, to conclude from this is that for architecture to contribute to our psychosomatic health, to make us feel good, and eventually also to contribute to construct the ground for cultures in our multicultural world, it must first be emotionally resonant with human actions. Because the other thing that has been become very clear, you know, people think about, you know, talk about it as, a, you know, emotional thinking, is that emotion is really at the roots of cognition. We cannot know anything without feeling first. Uh, we, uh, particularly modernity, uh, in the wake of the cat, used to simplistically separate these things and, and imagine that feelings got in the way of clear thinking. But in fact, now we understand, I mean, that someone like um, Damasio, this Portuguese uh, neuroscientist that is incredibly brilliant, uh, he wrote a book called uh, Descartes' Error. He basically uh, um, demonstrates how in, even when you look at the brain, it is not possible to have clear cognition without emotion. They are connected. So emotion is crucial. And you know, the, a lot of the arguments for modernism was that emotion didn't matter, that you had to solve things rationally, that that's all you need to do. As an, as an interior designer or as an architect, has to do with the rationality of the situation. But in fact, we now know that the emotional dimension of the situation is primary for us to understand anything. So that already tells you something, right, about, about, this, about this problem. So uh, emotion being the foundation of cognition, I argue that finding ways to design atmospheres for human events rather than designing novelty objects, you know, that, that merely uh, demonstrate some geometric complexity that no one has ever seen before, or a simple technical sustainability uh, is not enough, right? That the way to go fur forward in our discipline, whether you're dealing with interiors or you're dealing with architecture in general, is to, to understand that what you are doing is designing atmospheres for events. And I guess, you know, it's very fascinating to me because I think that is something that maybe interior designers generally have the, a better understanding than architects because architects usually look at the, at the building, you know, as a geometric object, yeah. right? So, uh, so I think this is what, what, what I believe, this is what the book is about, right? That, 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 the, that the issue is the design of atmosphere for events that and in ways that that acknowledge the importance of emotion. Okay, I, I think I saw I saw like uh, in one of your seminars you were mentioning a book from Richard. Ah, Richard Sennett, maybe Sennett. Sennett. Yes, yeah, Sennett, and you were saying that they used to build uh, the spaces according to the role 
of the inhabitant of the space in society. So it, yeah. may, it makes a lot of sense, you know, if you're going to, to design something for someone, you need to uh, bring out the emotion and to empower this uh, role that the person has so the person can thrive and the person can have a better life thanks to the design itself. So I, I, um, I was really happy to hear that from you when I saw your seminar because it, you know, sometimes you have this, I have these intuitive ideas, but I don't know how to express them. But when I heard all your seminars from 1988 from Mexico, I, I tried to, you know, to recall them all. And this was a very important part. So now, for example, um, on our next question, uh, going back in time, okay, in this, there is any historical data of how people were affected by ancient spaces? Well, yes, I'm not sure we call it data because you understand data is a term that is used for experiment. Yeah, in psychology, yeah. And so experimental, the idea that you reduce experience to experiment is also a modern, it's also a modern invention. Yeah. You know, because you have to frame things out of life uh, and in doing so, in a way, you, you do violence to what you're observing. So I would not call it data, but there is certainly evidence Evidence, evidence. Uh, yeah, of how people were uh, affected by, by ancient spaces. For example, already in, in the first uh, text that we have in the European tradition uh, of architectural theory, which is a text written by this man, you may have heard about Vitruvius yeah. in, the, uh, in the time of, uh, of Augustus Caesar, the beginning of the Roman Empire. Uh, really, he lived between, you know, right around the age of uh, the time of Christ, between a little bit BC to AD, he, he, that's his, those are his dates. He wrote this text. And even there, uh, uh, we find that he understands meaning, the meaning of, of architecture, uh, uh, as, as beauty and psychosomatic health being basically synonymous. So the, the meaning of, of the architecture would also be its beauty and would also be the fact that it's healthy, that it contributes to psychosomatic health. It's not separate things. It's basically one thing. That's what we can gather from this text. So the very quest of architecture was really to make these uh, uh, um, places for well-being, you know, and well-being was also associated with beauty. Beauty, in the, precisely in this sense, as something which appears self-evidently for the people. It's not something that comes, is from the top down. It's something that basically, comes from the bottom up, right? This, uh, on, this, on, this understanding of something that is both good and beautiful. The associations of medicine, for example, and architectural theory were very common until early modernity in European theory. So it is clear that the values are integrated and humans thought this kind of, if you could say, holistic attunement. Another interesting example that I can give you, and it's, it's actually quite enigmatic, uh, is when we try to understand the, the mysterious purpose of what, uh, well, now specialists think is the very first ever temple that was built by our distant human ancestors in a place that is now in Turkey. It's called Gobelki, Go, Gobekli Tepe in Southeast uh, Anatolia. We know uh, from dating, it, this is actually something that was only found in the 1990s, actually. Nobody had excavated this site, so it's actually a re relatively recent uh, find. We know that it was built around 9,500 BC, you know, which is really very, very ancient. If you think that, uh, that, that it's about 7,000 years before Stonehenge. Wow. So it's very ancient. It's the first ever temple. I, I wish I could show you a picture because it has kind of, a circular, it's a set of stones that make a circle. You know, you can Google it. I uh, think I saw back. it. Just to make sure, give me the name again and we'll attach the link down for the audience to leave. Yeah, to see. What's the name? Gobekli Tepe. It's G-O with umlaut, with little dots. Okay. G-O-B-E-K-L-I hyphen T-E-P-E. -E. It's the name of the place. Okay, I it's will. The name of the place. In modern Turkish, of course, you know, it's, uh, yeah. We'll try to Anyhow, 
Yeah, it's fascinating because because people, you know, you know, people always thought that that we first built cities and we were first practical and hot, and then we built temples. But this actually is the opposite. Is the earliest thing ever that we have found made by people is actually a temple, and it's made by hunter gatherers. You know, the people that were actually nomads right? that would always move. There were no cities, and these ancestors of ours, they were already homo sapiens, of course. Yeah? They had flourished for around 50,000 years in our planet. They had a very good life. They went around, they hunted, they gathered their food, and they lived perfectly good lives with good diets. You know, people have looked at their bones and they were very healthy, actually healthier than the earlier people, than the people that first founded cities because agriculture changes the diet and in fact, it becomes more difficult to have a healthy, balanced diet. But that's another story. So anyhow, this, this, it's very interesting because the temple, you could say, predates a little bit or starts to coincide with the, what, the, what anthropologists call the agricultural revolution, the beginning of sedentary life and the eventual development of cities. So it is as if somehow Homo sapiens, of course, I can only speculate on this, nobody really knows, but it is as if suddenly humans had become aware of something other that they needed. You know, fundamentally important, obviously, for their psychosomatic health. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bothered because, and somehow beyond this immediate continuity that they cultivated with the, uh, the natural world that was always perceived as a kind of animistic living thing, you know, and had always provided ample sustenance. Yeah, so, so somehow you can imagine uh, our ancestors decided collectively to accept a more difficult life, to build this huge thing where obviously thousands of these nomads from different bands had to cooperate over a long period of time to build this, this, this structure. You know, and it really has this kind of cosmic resonance as if something, wow. something, you know, was absolutely necessary. So this is to me very interesting, you know, that because we, it really uh, tells you that as humans, and I don't believe in dogmatic religions, I think they are problematic, you know, I don't go to church, but at the same time, I think humans need a kind of spiritual dimension and architecture needs to be aware of this, right? It's beyond this question of the immediate uh, um, uh, material need. Wow. So that's something that, uh, and that, that, that I think, and, and that really connects to psychosomatic health. I think that's the kind of thing that Vitruvius talks about and that most traditional architects recognize. You know, that, that the, the, this order that architecture provides, yes, you know, has a political purpose, can become nasty because it can be used by sovereigns to dominate people. It has all these dimensions that people always talk about, but, at the, but, but, but most fundamentally, it, it, it obeys this need that we have as humans to make environments that speak to our, to our spiritual needs, that make us whole. Exactly. And so that's what, yeah, so that's what, uh, that's what I can tell you about um, that. That's, well, that's what we see in history, you know. This becomes, of course, less clear with the beginning of modernity because people think that Basically, this is made up, that we don't need these kinds of things, you know? That's right. Yeah, this is true. Like, people think it's, it's made up to make money or, or it's unnecessary or it's luxury, which is not. That's, and that's, uh, that's why I wanted to ask you, had it ever crossed your mind that a design which is attuned to our psychosomatic well-being could have the ability to become a fundamental right yeah, of course. Well, no, it has never crossed my mind, Natalie. No. It's a very nice thought. It's a, it crossed it's a, it's my a mind. I, I, it, it did cross my mind because I did a study law in, back in yeah. Colombia, uh, and I never work as a lawyer, but it crossed my mind because uh, uh, health is a fundamental right, okay? That's right. So yeah. anything that uh, prevents our health to be damaged, it should be a fundamental right. So if sure. the spaces can uh, improve our health and not only prevent it, improve, because it's neuroscience is proven that 
you can uh, recuperate your health. So it's not prevention, it's to recover your health. So it should be a fundamental right. But yeah, it crossed my mind and maybe I'm, I'm nuts, but I had to ask you this. You are not nuts. I wish, I, it, it would be nice really, you know. I think it would, mean, it would really mean dismantling really the, some of the most fundamental values that drive uh, techno-capitalistic uh, ideology, you know, and that's a, that's a tall order, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, because usually modern humans can understand material needs, but, but uh, spiritual needs, you know, it gets very dicey, right? Because it, it, uh, it can also be perverted. And and I I I you know I I I wouldn't I would I would uh, hate that this become like uh, something that is that drives the the right uh, you know to impose values on 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 people by saying that you know you, we have to go back to church. It's yeah. not about that, right? So it's a very tricky problem, and and I think uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's a delicate thing to talk about. Uh, I mean, you know, I, a, a very nice philosopher, Gianni Vattimo, uh, Italian man, he's, um, he's, I think, younger than me. He's written some very good books. He talks about his, his concern about that. I mean, he's, uh, I think, deep down, he's uh, very left-wing, but he's also homosexual, and he's also religious. He tries to, to, to be religious, so he has a big dilemma, right? And he talks about these problems, and he... He basically concludes that 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 what what the best we can do is sh demystify the things that appear as absolutely unshakable, like the the values of this techno capitalistic ideology, to show that there are other ways to live, but and that out of these cracks maybe some of this understanding of uh, our need for the, for the spiritual could could emerge. But, uh, but certainly not impose anything from the top down, right? So, so you, it has to come from the culture and, uh, and it's a very tricky problem. But, but, but I agree that, it, that it, should be, it should be our right to live in a healthy, a, an environment that, that, that promotes our psychosomatic uh, well-being. I mean, it's clear for those of us, I'm sure you have perceived it because you have traveled, uh, for those of us that have the... the, the, the you know they, that we've been fortunate enough to see different environments in the world it's clear that if you are in an environment uh, usually an older town or city that has been created with 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 care basically even only the the, the care of the craftsman that gets vested into the stones of something very ordinary even that makes you feel much better you know and and, and contribute to 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 your well-being Whereas a lot of the things that we build in, in modern cities are, of course, horrible, you know, like uh, housing developments and stuff like that, that, that really, I'm sure, contribute to people's uh, psychopathologies. So, of course, there should be something like that, but it, it would be very hard to legislate. Just like I would say it would be very hard to turn this conversation into something that you could instrumentalize from the side of psychology, you know. I don't think it's so easy. I, 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 you know, I, I don't think you can make it into a methodology. You yeah, can, of course, right. yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. You know, it's, it's not easy. And, uh, but yeah, I can always try to at least bring this uh, information to people because the more brains we think about it, I believe something different might come. No, something you are absolutely good. right. Michael, like I have this South American inside me, you know, like you, I'm rebellious. And I, I think at the end, like you are here and I'm here at the end, I want to be there fighting and getting something out of this. Yes. No, I think it's, it's very good. I'm very happy that, that young people like you feel, uh, feel certain sympathy for these things because I've spent all my life fighting, you know, it's always hard. Alone. Like even in, even in my professional career, I mean, I, you're right. I am kind of well known, and I was very successful in my. In I had a full time position in in a very good university, but within my school, the the you know the tendency is always towards the sciences, like architecture. These kinds of things I'm talking about, you know. I, of course, I talked in my courses, but I was really a minority, like a minority of one or one and a half, with another very nice 
Colombian colleague, by the way, Ricardo Castro, who retired before me, was a very nice professor, very yeah. good friend of mine. But we were in the minority. The, 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 you know, the, the school now is all about sustainability and it's fine, you know? I mean, you have to talk about how to make wood more efficient and how to make uh, walls that breathe and all these kinds of things. But it's not enough, you know? I, th I, I think we, we need to understand that architecture, particularly in, in, in the long, if you understand it with all its, its depth from the beginning of our humanity, the, the concern always was far more than than this question of uh, the efficient solution of some of some material necessity. So, wow! Um, no, you are so I, right. You are so right. That, <laughs> thank you so much. Like it's inspiring to hear you. You know, like sometimes I'm waiting to to hear something like all what you are saying and with this coherence that you have, you know, because you have it in you for many, many years. You have thought about it a lot. So I do have uh, all my respect for you. I'm so grateful that you that you share with me all this knowledge that's going to be shared with all your colleagues, the architects and some psychologists that are interested. It's a real pleasure, Natalia. I wish you the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, you too. I hope the, the southern southern France is uh, not so uh, 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 like troubled by the COVID situation. Take care of yourself, please. It is it is troubled by the COVID. I hope it's going to end soon. I hope, like you say, it's not a permanent thing. Um, so. Yeah.